in him. But now I must discover that completeness that's already done because he finished it on the cross. He resurrected from the dead and he said, Kendrick and Carrie King. It gives me great pleasure and honor to be elected. Come the flame of God. He's preparing us to be the fire of God. Because Hebrews says... It's been a long journey. It's been a long journey. I'm telling you, it's been a long journey. But I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to go in and understand the conclusion of the matter? In other words, we talked about 12 gates into the city. Notice there is a difference of 12 gates in the city or 12 gates into the city. So we have actually talked to you about how you enter in to the city, which is the city of the living God. The 12 gates into the city is an experimental relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. It's an experimental relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So when we look at that and we break it down, the Father is all and in all. The Son is the fulfillment of it all. And the Holy Spirit is the glue that gather and the magnet that brings it into one and hold it together and they all are brought together in one body, in expression. Jesus Christ is the head. We are the body. We live this life by faith, not by work. It's by the grace of God that we are saved. So we enter into a season of grace. And we're coming into now the purpose of the assembly. It's almost like whenever you buy a bicycle, you buy it in a box. And on the box, it says some assembly is necessary. So what you have to do is once we unpackage it, then every part has to come and find its place so that it can function as one whole. The purpose for the assembly is that we come into the realization and we see that in Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, it talks about, it talks about it's appointed unto men once to die, then the judgment. This was actually pointed to his death and his second return of the Holy Spirit. It says in 27, it says, it's appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment, but it also said, this is also of Christ and the church. And those that look for him a second time, without sin unto righteousness, he will appear to them that have an expectation. So we begin to realize that those that had an expectation of the Holy Spirit received the power and the second coming. The Spirit of God was to gather all things unto him. So he came back in the realm of spirit so he could draw us into the oneness of him who he was. And he said that he was coming and when he returned, he was going to receive us unto himself. And where he was, we would be 
also. And what it denotes is that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and therefore we are in him, and we are in that same place. So it goes on to say, do not forsake the assembly. This is important because the assembly is not a church building. The assembly is not some organizational structure. The assembly is being drawn into assembled in him. It's in him that we live. It's in him that we move. It's in him that we have our being. So the spirit of the gathering of all things is in him. So when we understand that, we don't want to forsake the relationship of him because when we gather together, it is unto him. It is not unto a doctrine. It is not unto a preacher. It is not unto a gift. It's unto him. He is the day. So the gathering is in the day, and it's a glorious day. And there's never been a day like this day before. It's never been a day like this. He is the day, Hebrews 10, 25 through 29. So assemble ourselves together because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So what you understand, what was his goal? What was his ambition? His goal and ambition was to save your soul. So in the gathering together, you gather so there is a protection because you're going to need some godly relationship when he acts to save your soul and cut you off from all things in Adam and bring you into the all thing in the likeness of Christ and you will be blinded and then you need the fivefold ministry, the gifted ministry, so that they can actually guide you through the process and we begin to realize that he himself is the gathering place. And the Father God is the one that is the fire that, re that, re that, that removes all things that are not of him. He that believeth must walk by faith and not by sight. It's amazing that the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, you have to understand if he says, seek ye first, that was the first thing. That wasn't all there was. So what he really wanted to do is come unto me, all that are labor and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. He's literally saying, if you come to me, I will give you rest, and then you will find rest for your soul, and out of the rest of your soul, you'll find the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So God's purpose was to come into you and bring you into a place of oneness with himself and you really begin to see the real picture. So what are we saying? First of all, he brought you because he met you. He put in you a foundation and he said in Hebrews 6, 1, 2, and 3, don't lay again the foundation of repentance from dead work, faith towards God, and all of those other things, and even the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, foundation. He says, I'm going to lay that in you, give you a clear understanding of what that means, but he says, lay them not again. Go on to perfection, if God permits. So God is permitted us to go on beyond foundation and in that is formation. So the formation of God is bringing you into the form of his likeness and his image and the Holy Spirit 
is the one that brings it to pass. So it's by grace that he brings down one and exalt another and you see the one. So even after the formation, we come into an understanding of a graduation. In the graduation, we see him face to face. And as we see him face to face, we see who we are in his face. We really begin to see in that new place of graduation, we see that we have become like him. And it says in 2 Corinthians 3, it says he is that liberty. He is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we found the liberty in the faith of Jesus Christ. That's our new genesis. That's our new faith. Because as we see his faith, he actually reflects back to who we are. And it causes us to be brought into a transformation. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says, Now that we have come to glory, now that we have come to the day, now we go from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord because there's a new thing that's at work in me. It's a new person that's living out of me. And I begin to realize that this treasure now is found in earthen vessels, so the excellence would be of God and not of us. So the excellent one lives inside of me, so all I can produce is that which is excellent, that which is a life. So now we are on a continual educational route. And out of that, from the insert, in time, inside, it actually releases a manifestation of the glory of God. I have prepared you in the 12 gates so you now come into the realization that you are free. You've been set free by the Spirit of God. You come into this new place and you understand something that God is doing a new thing in and among us all. And what we realize is that in the closing of the 12 gates, we begin to ask and answer the question, what was the purpose? What was the goal of this course? So what you don't realize is you have just walked through, if you walk through with me, was a course curriculum in the 12 gates of the city, a snapshot of all the experiences of God and brought into the reality of what? One, to establish a unity of purpose as an administrator of justice for all. Two, to give each of you a determined purpose for knowing God and Jesus Christ. Three, to bring you into the full maturity of the seed that's in you. And the seed is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Four, this was not a doctrinal course. It was a relational course to be a living expression by the experience whereby you have met the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And five, this course only dealt with two men in the earth, Adam and Christ. It dealt with two natures the old and the new. The two natures was one was brought to an end and the other will be taken away. It's an inside job. So the reason the world does not see you changing is because it's done within the temple, in the veil, and God is unveiling himself in his saints. 
two men in the earth. The math is not hard. God removes the old, manifests the new, and the mystery now has been revealed. The secret is known. The word is out. God has come taking up residence in his people, and now they have the hope in them. So, when you look at the schoolmaster in Genesis 32, it marked a change of nature. And the change of nature was the end of the old nature was Joseph. And the beginning of the new nature was Benjamin. And we see in it, in Isaiah 45 and 18, it says, but thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. So the earth was just not made in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. So this is your place of residence, the earth. I am the Lord and there's none else. So he says, I am the Lord. I formed this thing. I created it for man. And I have come to establish you in your earth. John 5, 39, it says, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they that testify of me. But he said, you won't come to me that you might have life. You're looking at your own ability. You're looking at a dispensation that is not the dispensation of grace. You're looking at it from Genesis to Revelation and calling it progressive. But I call it two covenants. The old covenant, which Jesus fulfilled. The new covenant is what Jesus revealed. So now in Ephesians 1 and 10, it's a new administration. He says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and in, on earth, even in him. So the gathering is in him. So we begin to realize that in Ephesians 3 and 2, say, if we have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, in other words, God has given the revelation to Paul. God has given the revelation to the apostles of the Spirit. So they're being brought into an understanding that you are now in a place called there, where he is. It is the spot where you are. And the spot is the place of the gathering. So the gathering is in a spot, a place that is a manifestation of the glory of God where his presence dwells. Apostle Arthur Lee, he would say it's under the banana grove. I asked him one day, I said, Papa Lee, how do you determine where you build a house of God? He says, wherever the presence of God is, it marks the place of the gathering. And this was a revelation in East Africa. And now they have come into a homeland in Kenya. And that is where there is a gathering together of an understanding of the connection of JFI Global and New Fellowship. And we are one in the earth and we are manifested in America and Africa. And we're returning to the homeland. What's that? The spot. For a covenant to be legally valid, it can only be if there is full disclosure. And full disclosure is a full explanation and understanding at the time of the agreement. So I have brought you into a place that you can see the full picture 
before you come into agreement because if you come into agreement without understanding, you come in ignorant, it cannot be binding. If it's not in agreement and full disclosure, otherwise the contract is invalid. So we see a system that has been established that there has not been full disclosure, therefore slavery of any kind is enveloped because God owns all and in all. God has delegated this authority to his firstborn son, the heir of all things. So now we've been brought into this world that we will now be the shepherds of the world because we are sent by ambassadors to the owner under the auspice of the firstborn and the ministry is in the church and the marketplace and it's to be both fruitful and successful. It's a balance. And the revelation of the kingdom of this world is saying that all entities, all entities, and all of the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdom of God and his Christ. What kingdom? What does it look like? I'm glad you asked. So the kingdom of education is coming unto the kingdom. The, king, the kingdom of, of, of media is coming under the auspice of the kingdom. The kingdom of business is brought under the kingdom, uh, under the umbrella of the kingdom. Politics is brought under the kingdom of God. The ecclesia, which is the people that will bring it to pass. Arts and entertainment will be brought under the kingdom of God. Now, here's what God said to me when he told me on the mountaintop when I was in, in, mountain, in, in Vietnam, and I later asked him, he said, we must do it again. That the civil rights movement was a practical application of what the church must do. But he went on to say, in that move of God, we lost the musicians. We lost arts and entertainment. We lost it to the world system. But he said, we'll not lose it now when we do it again. And he says, as you go forth, be still and know I am God. He brings us to a place of rest so that we can enjoy living as he brings all things under his authority. So returning to the homeland and the spot is the purpose that God desires so that the new defines the focus and the purpose of why we need this new leadership in the kingdom of God. We need proven leadership that literally has come to see Joseph, Jesus, and has come with a sock, a, 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 a cup in the sack, a silver cup, redemption. They've been changed. So they see Joseph. So the leaders that are coming forth now has experienced persecution as Saul on the Damascus Road. And the question has been asked of them, what are you? to do now, and that is you will go forth and suffer many things because you are my leadership. So also, this leadership will have the spirit of the charisma of God. So a leader that is charismatic never lose sight of their purpose or their focus. The purpose and focus never changes. That's the vision. However, the methods must change. Why? It's because we go from glory to glory as by the spirit of the living God. So we begin to realize the world needs now charismatic leaders because they fight 
for the quality of life and a better world. Charismatic leaders have the courage and the conviction to speak truth to power. They are willing to stand up to the people who have a different view of the society and organization because they've been given the commission to bring forth what they've been sent to do. Charismatic leaders are driven by their convictions and their commitment to their call with purpose, vision, and passion. Purpose, they know the why. The vision, they see the what. The passion, they have the anointing too. A charismatic leader is a transformation, a transformational leader. They know how to move from one degree of understanding to the other, and they, one, try to make the status quo better, while, two, transforming the organization into the leader's vision. So now it's just not obeying the organization, it's seeing him who is the leader, and here's how it was explained with Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. Martin Luther King was a charismatic leader who used the power of oratorial skills and engaged his people personality and unwavering commitment to a positive change in the lives of millions of people. So what you have to understand is this vision is bigger than you and the postage stamp you live on. This vision is for the nations of the world and millions of people. Charismatic leaders know that they are often identified in the time of crisis. They're not needed until there's extraordinary understanding and they exempt exemplified devotion to the expertise of their field that they're in. So God is gathering together those that are experts in media, those that are experts in education, those that are experts in business, those that are experts in politics, in politics and arts and entertainment, and they didn't get their wisdom from the system, they got it from God. It was birthed out of the nature and the character of God. They may or may not have a degree. It's not based on your degree. And I tell people all the time, i got a university, but I credential the anointing, not the knowledge. You can have the knowledge, but have not the anointing, you can't bring it to pass. These are people that often, people that have a clear vision they clearly see and clearly understand that this is the way. Walking in it, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, don't go to the left nor the right. Walk straight on. Charismatic leaders appeal to the emotion of the audience and says, come, follow me. I'll show you the way. In the charismatic leadership style, they are working together and working towards the gathering of all that emphasizes that we are free and we want to walk in the liberty whereby God has given us. The gift and the calling of God is not without repentance. In other words, God has called you. He'll never uncall you. Your behavior does not cancel your assignment. Get up. Let's go. Charismatic leaders, they typify and inspire employees to perform. And as different than an autocratic leader, an autocratic leader use their authority to demand high performance, not God. God is not calling them. Matter of fact, he's bringing them down. Why? Charismatic leaders are from all walks of life. They're not brought out of any one mold. They're brought out of every culture, every language, every place. In addition, 
to business, this leadership style can be found in religious institutions, in political institutions, in social movement. They're just everywhere because it's God choosing them now. Includes sensitivity to their environment and the need of their employees and followers. In other words, they go and exalt the lowest and tell them, serve with gratitude, with excitement. They bring with accuracy the vision of the visionary so that the whole house can be anointed, included towards personal risk taking. In other words, do it even if you have to take a risk. Because you can't lose the life that God is. They adapt as using unconventional behavior. So they're raised up to do things different. And so people can see what the difference. And come to an understanding that God is dealing with something bigger than sociology. With something bigger than psychology. We're something bigger than theology. We're something bigger than Methodist, Baptist, and the church system. It's something bigger than you can see with your eyes. So in order for you to see it, you must turn in where Christ is. Charismatic leaders have an understanding that they inspire people to work together for a common cause. We're coming together so all men can be great. Because all men can serve. It's an organizational structure only to put together something that people can follow. And it's committed to a central mission. Christ is to make the poor better. To bring the rich into a right mindset. And pushing forward. And management priorities are, it's learning from mistakes. And efforts to succeed in this mission, but they don't live in the past. Charismatic leaders are led by the company and the tendency to move to the next level. And as we come into this understanding, we begin to realize that they are working as one entity because a great leader, Trust the Lord's wisdom rather than man. The great leader trusts and teaches others to do the same. The pattern of this understanding you'll see in the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, we'll give you the scriptures and just the principle, but we may come back and visit it later because we want to talk about now we're moving into having the practical theological understanding, which is God, and the practical application, which is your life. And the life application is the vision that God's given you to bring to pass. So here's the pattern. Psalms 3, I mean Proverbs 3, 1 through 4 is the principle. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Proverbs 5, 3, 5 through 10 is the practice. This is what you do. You honor the Lord with the substance and the first of all that increase. And Proverbs 3, 11 through 18 is the life application. Read that in the context and put it into practice in your life. This pattern, if you follow it, will produce for you wholeness that results in blessings and healing. Practice without fail giving to the Lord. Let me say it again. Practice without fail of giving first fruit 
tithe, offering, on, and pay taxes. Let me say it again, because we're going to come back and visit this again on our next presentation because we want to talk about the blessings of the sec of the Corinthians church. Practice without fail. I don't care if you're in a church house. I don't care if you're in no house. I don't care if you're in the out house. Find a gift that you can hear the voice. Sow into them money. Here's what I'm saying. Sow and without fail, give first fruit, tithe, offering, alms, and pay taxes. And let the minimum be 10%. The minimum. Because you're going to come to right feel out like that God is actually bringing you into a system of generosity. This is out of the new nature. It's out of a new understanding, not the law. It's not legalism. It's the law of the spirit of Christ in you, which is liberty. Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We come into the place that we find that mercy and truth has kissed each other. Psalms 1, 11, 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when you have a deep reverence for God, he'll begin to open up wisdom for you, for your business, for your understanding, wherever you're walking. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments his praises endureth forever. As we see this, we'll say in closing, and we'll pick this up tomorrow, because it says, if you fail to honor with all, your, all you have, God has said, I will blow on your prosperity. Spirit, we begin to understand is eternal. Principles are in time. So you need to apply the principles in time to establish a balanced life to be both fruitful and successful. The spiritual entity is the spirit and the relationship with God which gives you peace as you function out of the city whom you have become. This is the end of the matter, that God has brought you into the face of Benjamin and caused you to see that you are a new creation in time. And he has sent you forth not to suffer, but as to lead. And the principles of approaching this start with understanding the approaches to money management. Father, we love you and we praise you. We give you honor because now we function out of the throne of God.